presentation. Um, while the depots started in the 40s, um, there were some other things in Dayton that were going on at the same time. Charles Allen Thomas was a noted chemist and businessman who held over 100 patents. He and Ted Hockwalt co-founded Thomas and Hockwalt Laboratories in Dayton, Ohio, which was soon purchased by Monsanto. In 1943, Thomas was recruited to coordinate a research and development product to produce polonium during World War II as part of the larger Manhattan Project to build the first atomic bombs. Known as the Dayton Project, the plutonium purification and production work was carried out at various urban sites in and around Dayton, including the Runnymede Playhouse on the grounds of the Talbot family estate. Working with Charles on the project was Carolyn Beatrice Parker, the first African-American woman known to have gained a postgraduate degree in physics. In 1949, the Mound Laboratories facilities were completed in nearby Miamisburg, and all of the work was moved there. The Dayton Project would provide the world nuclear innovation. This next panel up here is going to discuss innovation at the edge. Oh, I guess we're on. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. I, I think uh, this is a great transition uh, in, in the conference. Um, we've got a great panel that's really focused on delivering that technology at the edge. And I think all the digital transformation that we've talked about today um, really is just demanding that faster data distribution um, and taking all that information and technology and capabilities outside of the traditional <coughs> siloed environments. Um, and so we're going to let the panel introduce themselves and get into the questions. Um, so I'll start, I'm going to start with um, uh, Joe at the end, if you don't mind, and uh, we'll work our way down. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, I am... Um Prior Navy background, 23 years active duty Navy, sneaking in, doing uh, great work with the Air Force. Uh, but uh, privileged to have that opportunity. It's one of, I, I tell people, four hats I wear to, that kind of help me, I, I hope, bring perspective to some of these solutions. So I wear that warfighter hat. Uh, then I got the crazy idea to start this company, and thinking that we could help make a difference. And, and so I wear that CEO hat. Uh, I have a systems engineer by background. Uh, and then I frequently find myself putting my taxpayer hat on too, usually when I'm really frustrated with the process. Uh, but I, I, I hope that those different backgrounds and perspectives help to provide some, some useful insight. Thank you, Joe. Okay. John? Uh, hi, John Mitchell. Uh, day job, I wear the Chief Technology Officer hat for Illumination Works. Um, I'm also the CEO, but I, I've farmed off 99.9% .9 of those job duties to other folks over the last uh, three or four years. Um, started the company about 17 years ago, supporting the Air Force, a lot of data, data exploitation work. Um, and as we've kind of moved forward, uh, found ourselves doing a lot of uh, edge innovation. How can I deliver data to uh, the user base? What is the, the mechanisms by which that makes the most sense to them? So that, that user-centric perspective. Um, done a number of VR, AR, and, and IoT projects uh, with Sean and his team across a number of the services. Um, the other thing we're, we're looking at uh, pr probably most heavily right now is how do we do the human machine teaming piece with AI? So how do I use um, the buzzwords and, and really deliver mission capability that impacts the execution of the day-to-day -day mission? Thanks. Daryl? Uh, Daryl Roy. I am the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, 3D Media. We're a small business out of Thibodeau, Louisiana. Um, you get extra points if you can spell Thibodeau. But um, so um, background is a uh, U.S. Army vet and uh, spent about 10 years in commercial nuclear operations um, and then founded 3D Media uh, probably about 2016. And um, we cut our teeth in the oil and gas industry, solving problems there. And in 2019, we were awarded our first cyber with the Rapid Sustainment Office, and we've been solving warfighter problems since then and continue to do so and uh, feel very grateful to be able to do, to be able to do that on a daily basis. It's a, it's a pretty awesome place to be. Great. And Dr. Bernstein, please. Hi, my name's uh, Bill Bernstein. I'm the branch technical advisor for digital manufacturing supply chain at AFRL, Air Force Research Lab, within the Manufacturing and Industrial Technologies Division, uh, formerly known or traditionally known as Mantech. 
Um, so I have oversight over three Mantech programs, that being additive manufacturing, which Dr. Benedict did a great job representing earlier today, digital enterprise, which is focused primarily on digital supply chain, digital thread, digital twin problems. And I think what's most relevant for this particular group is the Future Factory program focused on AR, VR, and advanced robotics. Awesome. Well, uh, as you can see, uh, we've got panel members that are literally delivering and, and researching this technology uh, every day. They built a whole business on this. Um, and then Air Force lead that's, that's really responsible for implementing and scaling. So, uh, Dr. Bernstein, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, really uh, want to ask, you know, help us help set the stage for the discussion for everyone, uh, but provide, provide us a quick review of some of the problems and gaps you're trying to solve uh, through this innovative technologies. Um, and are there any specific technologies that you kind of just described? And maybe you've already answered that question, but you know, kind of help help set the stage for us. Sure. So we could go in a lot of di different directions with this particular question. But I think given the, the panel represented here, I think the best way of starting is within um, how we can use AR, VR, and advanced robotics within our uh, customer portfolio. For Mantech programs, uh, a big customer for us is our sustainment centers. So we were prefaced very well this panel by the, um, the great presentation that we just heard. Um, so uh, sustainment centers, um, are, or depots, are, are a very interesting environment given that um, they, are, they do have some legacy processes that they simply cannot afford to uh, shovel to the side, um, but they're constantly trying to insert new technology. This offers a very uh, complex environment, specifically how the human can engage with these new technologies. Um, so I see a lot of uh, science and technology gaps, specifically within how we can uh, bring, essentially, these new technologies to the people that they are then working. Um, one kind of mantra that we use within the Future Factory program is this idea of bringing that technology um, to, or bringing the process to the part or to the thing that you're trying to improve, rather than building monumental uh, robotic systems and then bringing, for instance, um, uh, off aircraft wings to, to fix some problem on that, on that wing. Um, so a lot of our programs, um, or projects I should say, within um, the Future Factory program are really focused on this idea of agility and mobility. I think currently somebody told me this, that we still don't have a C1, D1, D1 compliant uh, mobile robotic system. Um, so we're, we're very early in terms of um, building out these fully autonomous systems that can um, assist within very austere environments, let's say within the, the actual battlefield. That being said, we're still not quite there in terms of um, delivering that capability directly to the depot. Um, but we have made significant advancements and have demonstrated the value therein um, through some recent, recent efforts. I would just say a personal interest of mine is um, helping us become more interoperable when delivering augmented reality systems, not only to the depot, but I guess across industry in general. Um, right now, a lot of these um, AR systems and applications, and I, I don't know if the panelists would disagree or agree, um, are often uh, created at one-off kind of uh, scenarios. Um, it, you either have to entrench yourself in a particular platform. Uh, many of those uh, folks that create those platforms are represented here today which there's no problem with that. Um, but if you look at the, the wider defense industrial base, um, many different people are playing with many different platforms. So quite frankly, that solution is, is untenable. Um, one, one way of solving that problem is the introduction of advanced standardization um, within the digital models themselves. Um, and there's been massive waves in terms of the, um, the capabilities there. Um, you know, maybe a shout out in particular is the Open Standards Group, uh, Kronos Group, um, which has an uh, impressive list of membership, um, and they are really trying to, to bring out not only the capabilities that we see in the gaming and entertainment industries for AR, VR, but also include some of our industrial application problems. Um, I'll also just mention that we also have limited connectedness in terms of how we can learn across these different, let's say, robotic systems, for example. Um, again, um, let's just use machine vision as an example. Um, a lot of the, the off-wing problems that we face in terms of um, fixing autonomously with, a, or I should say repairing autonomously with a robot, um, is frankly that we don't have 
even if we do have the digital models of these parts, a lot of the holes and fasteners, et cetera, were created by humans um, decades ago. So you cannot rely on the digital models as a, as a proper placement of where that problem might exist. So you're left to the whim of the current capability of machine vision. And right now, currently without large infrastructure like motion capture systems, if you want to simply use, for instance, a point and shoot tablet capability from the camera that we all have, I, well, I presume we all have in our pockets right now, um, you really can't get beyond about uh, 10 millimeter accuracy. And even then, that's still using some advanced capability. Um, to be able to hit go on a robot and say, go take out this fastener um, wherever it's broken, we need much, much better capability than 10 millimeters. So I hope that, uh, that I at least kicked off a little Thank bit. Thank you very much. No, that's great. I, I guess I'll ask the rest of the panel to kind of maybe continue the thought. Maybe, Daryl, you can lead off, you know, based off your experiences in 3D media. And, and what, what, are you, what are you focusing on and, and where are you seeing opportunities? Yeah, no, I, I think um, there, you, you made some phenomenal points. You know, the interoperability side of things and the, the, the not being locked into a single platform is, is it's, it's pretty important, right? Where we... If, if, if our goal is to democratize a specific technology across an organization or across an entire industry, um, that that's got to be kind of a key function there. You know, both on the front side and on the back side, whether you're whether you're creating experiences uh, or you are taking data that is captured within an experience and sending it out to a legacy system. The other side of that, from the industry perspective, too, is that to have the ability to integrate with these legacy systems, it becomes it, it becomes a real stumbling block. Right. Um, I think Mr. Six kind of touched on this, but, you know, we, we, when you talk about 3D models, when you talk about technical orders, when you talk about integrating with work management systems, um, historically, I think our gov uh, government has, has been handcuffed in many cases. Uh, and to, to be able to open that up for, uh, for groups and for innovation, it becomes a challenge in many cases, right? How do you get the information from a particular airframe, from a particular piece of equipment? Um, well, if, if, if it, it all, I, I think it goes back a lot to acquisition and contracting, right? In the beginning, when, when these things are planned, and you can't go back in time, but looking into the future as new things are planned, how do you, how do you keep that in mind, right? If we're gonna be an agile, uh, a continually evolving organization as, 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 a, as defense, uh, we've gotta keep that in mind where we've, we've gotta have flexibility. We've gotta be able to share information, because ultimately, if we, if we don't, how are we gonna advance things, right? How are we gonna take things to the next level? So. <clears throat> I think, as I've seen a number of pilots that we've done, that other folks have done over the last three or four years, the, the, the disconnect is a little bit the cart and the horse scenario. We're, we have a lot of great initiatives going on around digital engineering and redigitizing things that are in 2D. And, and one of the things that we talk about when we talk about augmented reality specifically in, in an engineering context is we need those assets. And so while the technology is great and it's continuing to move faster than we can even imagine, there's, there's a lot of work that's going to have to go into and obviously is going on. Uh, the services and the Air Force is no exception to be able to digitize the information that they want represented in that visual spectrum. I think the other piece that, that we've seen, uh, and, and I echo what my colleague here said, uh, the interconnectivity, the interoperability. Um, uh, and, and then the other piece of this is the process, right? Um, we can't have AFIs that say one thing and, and the process trying to drive it to a different direction. Um, uh, yeah. That's the te having the tech data available yeah. when you're doing it. I gotta have it. Yeah, Joe. Well, and I think you touched on something that, that we think is critical to start with. Uh, every problem that you that you go to, and that is bringing a holistic systems approach to looking at that solution. Too many people focus on just the technology, especially if they get excited excited about the shiny thing, augmented reality, virtual reality, and they don't take a, take a, the time to look at the people, processes, and technology that together deliver performance and capability from a human system and they don't incorporate the needs of all of the key stakeholders in that system because it's important to understand that you're not really solving one problem. You're really trying to solve a whole spectrum of problems that are found in different stakeholder parts of the organization. Uh, and so you have to look at it holistically and then even if you're gonna deliver a, a visualization to help train somebody or perform some kind of a work package, 
The, the key is in the data. You don't understand what the importance of the data is unless you've gone through that systems of systems analysis. Sometimes you find out, you know what, your solution actually isn't a technology solution, it's a process solution. Maybe it's a people solution and we need some different training, but usually it's a combination. Um, but you, you've got to then, at the end of the day, go back to the, to the data um, and, and not focus on the, uh, the end state at the up front, that, that will naturally flow from your, your process uh, alignment and your, your data architecture. Thank you. Daryl, go ahead. If I could just kind of add on to something Joe just said. Um, when I think about innovation, I think of two main types. I think of strategic innovation. That's the cutting edge, you know, new computer vision algorithms, uh, new optical sensors, new ways of being able to visually display information, things like implants and contact lenses, and here before too long, Walby Borg. Um, but I think what's key in my mind for, for the Air Force particular is the tactical innovation, is how can we take the technologies that are available today that we can work within the environments we have to make those incremental improvements? Um, because this isn't gonna happen overnight. We're not gonna one day wake up and we're gonna be you know, wearing AR glasses. Um, so that tactical innovation is what can I do within the, uh, the co confines of today to make the airman's job better, to make the depot uh, line workers better, to solve an efficiency problem, a quality problem, um, so that there's, there's two big innovation blocks. I was thinking about that as we kind of prep for this session. Um, and so I think to, if it's me, you know, the, the, the strategic stuff has to go on, but we can't lose sight of improving the work today. Yeah, thanks, thanks John. That's a good segue actually, kind of what the next topic really discussion point is. And Daryl, maybe you can lead us off with this, but you know, uh, doc, Dr. Bill kind of talked about all the software that's out there, all the technology that's out there. and um, and there are a lot of commercial solutions. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's you know, with a lot of pre-built uh, capability. Um, what, from your perspective, what's, what's literally the maturity level and opportunity here uh, to really begin to move the needle in the operational environment at the tactical level uh, with this technology? That's, that's a great question. I think in terms of technology, uh, the, the maturity level is there in, in many technologies, not all of them. I think in many technologies, the maturity level on the most basic foundational kind of start point uh, is there. I think the technology is in a place where it is finding its home, where it adds value, uh, where, where it can be applied. Um, I think the bigger problem is not necessarily the, the technology maturity so much as, um, fi like I said, finding the home, finding home for these technologies, but it goes back to, our, to mission alignment, right? Well, we gotta, we've got to understand we're not at war boots on the ground in a particular country. We're, we're at war with complacency as a country. We're at war with, with, with doing things the old way, right? And that's, that's, to me, that's the big challenge that we face is how do we take, how do we look at technologies and, and, and say, you know what, this technology is, it, it can make a difference here but it's not really gonna add value in this place and being honest about those types of things. Or saying this technology is not necessarily ready for this, as uh, Dr. Bernstein mentioned, you know, there, there needs to be these advances. And then, and then leaning into where those needs are, right? Where, whether it's computer vision or, it's, or whatever the case may be, leaning into where those advances need to be made so that we can fill those gaps, we can, we can bridge those gaps. But it really all comes down to mission alignment where every person on the, on, at every level of, of the organization um, really understands that, sure, when it comes to bullets flying and bombs dropping, we, we're, in, we're, in a peace, we're in peacetime, absolutely. But in reality, we are not. In reality, this is, this is a war against our own complacency. We've gotta to continue to advance, we've gotta to continue to challenge ourselves as a country, as, as companies, right? Because we can't, we can't look at this as the way it's been for the last 70 years, right? We can't stay with our depots looking like they did in 1944. The capabilities, the efficiency, the effectiveness, the mission readiness of our troops, of our fighters, um, the, the way that it's been over the past 70 years. Because we, it's been real nice to be, to be the world superpower, but it ain't gonna last long if we don't do something different. That's just, it's just the, the truth of it. Maybe. Dr. Bill, I'll, I'll defer to you to lead on with this conversation, but you know, if the, if the end goal is scalability, and we might be at a maturity level where some of this is scalable, you know, what, 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 from your perspective, you know, where are we in, in that journey? Well, I think my former colleagues at NIST 
would, would uh, punch me, so to speak, if I didn't say standards are some way of a, a road to, to solve that problem. Um, but to piggyback off my, my colleague here, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll just say that um, if you look at the hiring patterns of a lot of the advanced tech solution providers, whether they be the cloud IT providers, some of which are represented in this room, um, or for instance, some of the AR, VR, game engine providers, um, they're hiring a lot of domain expertise, domain-specific modeling capability, folks that can go out and engage with the end, the end customer um, to basically bridge the transition gap from a, um, a more, I would say, uh, agnostic solution, like a Pokemon Go, for instance, uh, to actually bring it um, to something that can actually be used, for instance, in a depot. Um, so I think there's actually a lot of innovation. Um, it might not be as sexy as the latest computer vision toolkit, um, but, but this, uh, this modeling capability certainly needs to be there. I'll give a simple example. Right now, without a uh, Premier subscription to um, a game engine, you can't deliver um, GDNT, geometric dimensioning and tolerancing data, directly on a part through an AR experience um, uh, in, in its appropriate spatial uh, context. And that's simply not good enough if we're going to use AR, for example, um, to, to understand what somebody is looking at in front of them and to know what to do next to that part. So what would be, in your mind, like if that were the situation, what would be the, the, a better outcome there from a uh, perspective? Yeah. I, I think, okay, again, um, I, I've just been trained to always use the standards angle, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, I think there needs to be a, um, a confluence of different tech expertise um, to come together to solve these pretty specific domain entrenched problems. Sure. And what I mean by that is the ASME folks, the ASTM folks, the SAE folks need to actually be at the table during these, um, these conversations with, let's just say, the Kronos group or any of the other um, AR, VR standardization groups. Sure. I think right now the silos are completely disparate from one another. Um, and there's only a few of us, I think some of us are represented on the stage here, that are trying to break those barriers. I, I kind of asked the question here too, is that if, if, if that's, I love that idea where you have those standards in the product development fit cycle, but you ask the other side of it, like from the business case, and then, you know, what's the business case there? And then there's a push in the government for COTS solutions. And those two are kind of counter to each other, right? You, can have, you can't have a COTS solution that is specific to your use case. And so how do you bridge that gap? And I know it's not a, this is not a question for you specifically to answer, obviously, but it's something that we face as, as industry is like, how do you bridge that gap between the desire for COTS and then the requirement for, you know, reducing platform, like we don't want platform lock, obviously, that's not a good thing, but contracting challenges because government's not interested in SAS, the SAS model and, and all these other different challenges where you have to, you're, you have this conflicting between, and between a business model and the ask, right? Where does that, there's got to be a place where it meets in the middle. And I'm not, I, I guess the, the question is like, where does that, where does that happen? And I think you've got, you're onto something with, you know, having that, having that in the product design, like from the beginning, a product design kind of at that stage, bringing together those stakeholders to understand each side's needs and problems. I think we each have, we each have these silos where we have business needs and we have government needs and where do they meet, right? Because I can tell you, for our, everyone on this stage and every business that's here, we wanna solve government problems. But we've gotta keep people employed, we've gotta feed people, and so sometimes those things are conflicted. So where does, where does that meet? And I think that product design idea, right, that's, that's, that's gold, man. And I think this, this subject's gonna come up in a minute uh, when we talk about what, what's industry doing, you know, what are the manufacturers out there and the owners of the data are actually doing with this te technology. But you know, I know that what this conversation, Joe and I, I think, you and I talk about this quite often, uh, but this conversation of maturity and scalability, can you offer some more insight on that? Absolutely. So back to, you know, where is the technology? I would say in almost every case, it's farther along than people realize. And I think one of the biggest challenges, and this kind of bleeds over into, I think, some of the other topics, but they really are uh, interdependent, so forgive me. But the... In, in systems of systems, you know, theory, there's this principle of self-organization and you've got a bunch of really talented uh, airmen that have heard the, the chief say, go fast or lose, and they're all out there 
uh, because they're just patriots and they want to solve their own problem. And in many cases, they think that they're the only ones that have that problem. Uh, but then, so they're all doing great things and they don't realize what other work has been done. And it's just a huge challenge for, not just for the Air Force, but for all the services, because we see it, we do uh, work with the Navy, Air National Guard, great work with the Marine Corps, um, and everybody's got this challenge. But somehow there's got to be uh, a, a system, uh, a methodology that's built into acquisition processes and R&D processes and SIBRs to, to help create more situational awareness about the solutions that are out there. And just kind of, you know, if, if it's airing of, you know, grievances, but it's all non-attributional, right? So part of the, the frustration that we have, having been very successful in delivering some solutions that were where we worked uh, in, in some projects with directly with folks from HAF, Air Combat Command, Air Education Training Command, down to the warfighters on the flight line who need the solution, all involved in the process to, de to deliver a capability that, that they need uh, and are excited about putting into place. And then we constantly see over the course of the last couple of years, all over the Air Force, all different organizations and different stovepipes put out new cyber topics, asking somebody to go create the exact same thing, new OTA solicitations that come out to create the exact same solution. Um, and this is where I talk about with all four hats, I get really frustrated because what we're doing is we're, we're spending R&D dollars that we should use on adoption because from where I'm sitting, my limited perspective, it doesn't feel like it's an innovation problem. It feels like it's an adoption challenge. Uh, and so we're delaying, we're creating an opportunity cost because we're delaying adoption which is also allowing a, a readiness gap to be perpetuated. Um, and then we're having some redundancies. There's some really healthy things that happen when you have different self-organizing entities that have different system perspectives that can add value to whatever the ultimate solution is. But there has to be some way for folks to have more awareness about what's going on and realize that they're not alone in, in trying to solve this hard warfighting problem. John, I'll ask you maybe to continue the thought, but maybe get us into the conversation of, we've already kind of gone there, but you know, when do you take this out of the R&D side mm -hmm. of the house and into just straight procurement? Of so, so it just so happened last week, I went and looked at the Gartner hype cycle on augmented reality and industrial solution space. And we're not down there in the trough of disillusionment, right, where the early goes guys are out there playing around and, and failing left and right. You know, we're somewhere up at the top of the curve where you're right there between everybody's excited about it and you've got your early adopters really starting to drive that, that forward. So I, I think we are still very much on the early cusp of being able to take this. And I don't know if you and I have had this conversation, but I know I've had it with several folks. As I look at AR and VR as my kids' as kids' platform of of choice, right? So my kids grew up on smartphones and tablets, and their kids are going to grow up with visual, very much more immersive visual capabilities. Um, but that's a few years away. And so um, I, I think we're, we're on the precipice of more uh, adoption, but we're really still, we're only in that early adopter stage. And as much as we know it can solve specific point use cases, um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, particularly under standardization, uniform solutions. The only other thing that I would add to this, and this is just a personal philosophy, innovation isn't static and, and, and software isn't static. And if you look at a lot of the, the buzzwords that are being flown around and, and things around agile and, and iterative development and, and even DevSecOps as, as capabilities, what are we trying to do there? We're trying to incrementally deliver capability to the user, to the warfighter. It's not static, it's constantly changing. And I think in order to adopt something like AR or VR that's still in that very early phase, we're gonna to have to pick a point in the sand and start marching and understand that if we have to re-vector, that's okay. What's gonna be critical is the use of the engineering assets. So we can't be going off creating digital assets for one VR experience or one AR experience. We need to be taking advantage of that digital information that's going on in all those other initiatives. And if you have a VR AR platform that can't do that, well, that's probably not one we want to do because we have some very specific use cases uh, for that data. Dr. Bill, you want to, anything else you want to add? I mean, you, you're kind of through the standards flag on the field. 
and it's like, well, we can't do anything until we decide. And is that kind of where your thoughts are? You know, and, and where do you think we are in that? Are well, we close? Well, I think um, there are some um, available forums out there, public forums, where you can kind of get a sense of where we are. So, for instance, if you look at the cloud IT providers, uh, a few of them actually um, post publicly which particular microservices are um, at specific security levels. So you can get a sense of you know, what's possible and what's already out there beyond just creating your own special sauce, as, mm -hmm. as, what's, uh, as what was already mentioned. Um, I will say that, again, um, and I don't mean to keep repeating myself, but I just want to keep uh, banging on the idea that content management is of utmost criticality here. Mm -hmm. And it's where the lines really blur from whether we're talking about AR, VR applications or just digital enterprise in general. Mm -hmm. I think we need to rethink how we look at PLM systems rather than just purely exchange platforms, but also their accessibility. And I think scalability will come from that. I mean, think about if you were to represent a entire weapon system as a knowledge graph rather than uh, bits and pieces of uh, disparate data formats. Um, and you can imagine that situation where you'd be able to query directly on it, even with natural language. Um, that would tie very seamlessly with our vision of how folks are engaging um, in a much more intuitive way with, let's say, a headset. Um, so you wouldn't have to repurpose that content as a, I'm sorry, what, I forgot his, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. <laughs> John. But John, thank you. Um, as John already mentioned, it would already be caked into how we represent the, the product and systems. Yeah, I like where this is going, Daryl. Di the digital thread is what we're talking about. Sure. Right? And it's not about static experiences that look cool and your kids can play with. It's about real needle moving capability. So it can, maybe can kind of continue along that line of your experiences and in, in these kind of dynamic uh, AR, VR, or IoT related kind of capabilities. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, when 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 we talk about standardization and uh, all, all the you know those those type of topics, where we we go back to the to the agile methodology. I think one of the key things in, in anything is you like when you go back to the to, to being agile and constantly constantly changing things. It's really getting a good pulse on what the problem actually is, right? And the pop, the problem, you know, the problem that you're solving with each individual technology. Uh, it, it's really user focused and therefore those relationships with users that trust with a user that that individual that is willing to tell you and it's one of the reasons why our 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 uh contra our projects have been so successful is because end users essentially have the they they care enough about the mission and they trust the teams enough to say hey look we're not going in the right direction right we're not going to keep going in this direction something something's got to change right we, you deliver a product and the team says, hey, this is not, a, not exactly what we think will solve the problem. All right, well, let's revisit this. But it goes back to having that flexibility. It goes back to, in terms of contracting, in terms of the expected outcome, that target is going to move, right? So if we have, if we have milestones in contracts or milestones in a project or, or anything, regardless of what the organization is, the ability to have flexible milestones where, you know, if if goals change, if problems, new problems are, are identified, or if new challenges are, 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 are they, they pop, they show up, um, being able to pivot towards that. You know, it, in, in the startup world, you always have to be cognizant of the fact that a pivot can happen at any time. It's, it, it, it's actually quite likely in most startups. Very few startups start with an idea, <laughs> and at the end of the day, they're solving that same problem statement in the exact same way. Uh, one of the two may stay, stay the same, the technology or the problem, but it's very rare that they both stay exactly the same. Being able to have that flexibility to, to pivot and it being acceptable, right? Zero defect military, we, that doesn't get us innovation. That gets us automatons and that gets us things that they're not able to do things outside of the norm. Okay. Joe, Joe, uh, you and I have had a lot of conversations and, and you're doing work with major defense manufacturers today. Yes. Um, what, from your sense, what is this, you know, digital thread connectivity in, in, in the repeatability opportunities there with this data? So I, I think it's critical still. I mean, it, it's very repetitive. Everyone talks about it. it's about the data, but and it's a, it's about live data. It's about being able to be connected into 
maintenance information systems, logistics information systems, individual user data, uh, biometrics about the user and how they're performing and interacting with whatever the, the experience is. Uh, and we like to think of, of our experiences and environments, whether it's augmented mixed reality or a serious game simulation environment, that it's just a data visualization tool. And some of the discussion yesterday was about uh, decision superiority. So I, you know, we feel like at every level and every experience, it, it's still about a decision that the individual user is going to make. But maybe it's a tactical decision to solve a problem today. But still, is how do I how do I visualize those enormous amounts of data to enhance insight development and accelerate that decision process on the, that local level uh, to that specific problem, where whether it's a training task or an operational performance task, and then how do I how's that data living so it's it 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 stays with me? Um, but one thing that we've also talked about a bunch, Sean, is that. Uh, it has to, we have to have, not only we have to have robust data backbones that can, can, can connect to many different data sources, but we have to be resilient and agile with that data so that, one, we reduce a vulnerability. So when we lose that connectivity, we can get the mission done. And then we also have to be able to uh, be agile enough to be able to disconnect go perform the mission, whether it's a training or an operational mission, in an austere environment, and then reconnect to that network, into that federation, and re restore the integrity of that data set. Uh, and if we don't build that in from the beginning, then we do, we're just bringing more vulnerabilities into what we're doing. John, any continuing thoughts on that subject? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, kind of maybe building on what, what others have said and one of the things that I've, as I sit here thinking about it, one of the things that, that that's maybe dawned on me or, or maybe even didn't even think about until today is um, when we talk about edge, um, what are we really talking about? We're talking about different use cases, different locations, um, different outcomes, and, and, and the associated edge means different things to folks at Tinker than it does over in the AOR or some other place. And I think, um, you know, maybe this whole thought process around standardization and, and uh, one tool for AR or something like that, maybe, maybe that's a little broken in that there's going to be some software capabilities that are going to be much better at a connected capability than others because that's the way they were built. And there are other capabilities that maybe need to be purpose-built disconnected or semi-connected. Um, and that may drive us to multiple solutions that, that, that do that data visualization, depending on how we define edge for that particular use case or those particular uh, users. So just some, some thoughts as we've been discussing, it's rolling around in my head. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, we're coming, we have about 12 minutes left on the panel. If you have questions, please send those in uh, for the panel, but uh, we're going to keep rolling. And if there's any hands, anybody want to ask anything? We'll keep rolling here with this theme. If there's none, thank you. That's, I should have just asked for the QR code to go up. But Daryl, you know, I know you started your business around some of this. You know, there was you know kind of a compelling need for this capability um, due to some training events that occurred that you were involved in an accident. Mm -hmm. So yep. maybe share with us your you know kind of you know what are those real world kind of compelling needs that you're seeing um, and how are you solving those? Yeah. So what he's referring to is. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I worked in nuclear ops in, in addition to the Army and prior to that a little bit in the petrochemical industry. And um, in 2013, a guy that I worked with at a previous job, we had become friends. And um, so he'd worked, he, he went to work at a, um, at a, at a chemical plant. Uh, he'd been on the job for about four months. Um, he went out into the field one morning to, to perform a task. He was swapping heat exchangers. Three minutes after opening the first valve, there was a catastrophic failure, a blevy, a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Uh, it killed him, uh, his name was Zach. It killed Zach, it killed his supervisor and injured about 100 other people. And so like, he didn't get to go home to his, his wife and daughter that night. And so from that point forward, uh, it became a personal mission and ended up becoming a company to figure out a better way to do that. Um, and through research, figuring out that, not but finding rather not rather than figuring out, finding that virtual and augmented reality uh, are, are the best tools that exist to solve that problem, to solve the problem of 
of, of a good training, of getting information in the hands of decision makers and uh, action takers um, at the point of operation, right? And that's really what edge means, right? When we talk about edge in many cases, you know, you, you can apply it to different specific technologies, but when we talk about edge, we're, we're talking about the point of action, right? We talk about in the OODA loop, orient, observe, decide, and act. That all has a, has a place to play in this whole process, and, and virtual and augmented reality contribute to those in a very unique and powerful way, but edge is, is at the point of action. How do we bring these technologies to the point of action? Because we use, and then, bring, and then take, those, take those actions and put them back into the loop, right? How do, these, how, does the things, how do the things that we did in the virtual and augmented spaces contribute back to the Orient, right? What do we, how do we observe? How do we, how do we take that information that we've gotten, make a decision, and then take the next action? And then how do we do it faster and faster and faster? Because that's what it's about. It's that, that kill chain, that OODA loop, because the, when you win, you win because you, you make those decisions quicker and they're the right decisions, right? And that's what these technologies contribute to. And when you're doing them at the edge, you know, that's, that gives you the ability to capture a ton of true, not assumptive, but true uh, data points. And then the other thing you've got to ask yourself, this is something that kind of dawned on me while you were, while you were talking over there, to consider in any of these is, when we talk about data lakes, when we talk about all the information and the data that comes into these places and connecting it, we've got to understand that the data for the DOD, and everyone knows this in this room, right? But the data for the DOD is very different than the data you get from Uber or from Google, right? We can, Google and Uber and all these companies can take your data and sell it. And in most cases, it's not a national security risk. But when we talk about taking operational information from an F-35, operational information from a B-1 or a piece of age, we can't just have this, this huge data lake of all of this stuff that's interconnected to everything else. So that adds another layer of complexity to this whole thing. And instead of a data lake, Essentially, in many cases, we've got to have a data puddle, right? A series of data puddles. But we, making the decision of what data is, like, contributes to those things. Classifying information is, it becomes very different when you're able to capture real operational data in such an easy way. It's not just a matter of whatever this person typed out is it classified or not. No, we're talking about, like, how do you separate this stuff? The same TO, right? We just did this, this section of this TO. That's 150 steps in the cockpit of a B-1. Well, some of that is classified, right? Or some of it is cooey, or some of it, whatever the case may be, but a lot of it isn't, right? So how do, you, how do you separate those things to help to make decisions in the future and be the most effective? And that's something, you know, I don't have the answer to that. I think that's something we, we, we are evolving into asking ourselves, right? We're moving to a point where we solved a lot of these problems technologically. Uh, a lot of problems, not those, a lot of, we've solved a lot of problems with technology, but obviously anybody who builds anything, <laughs> physical or digital, you recognize that when you get done with one thing, you're on to the next one. And in many cases, you, it's hard to predict a lot of those things, but it's, um, it's interesting. It's, it's fun to think about what the next thing is going to be that we have to solve. Fun. I like solving problems. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, uh, quick question we have in, um, it's about, you know, obviously, there was a question here about standards, and, and it's really about the data again, you know. But, you know, maybe it's an <laughs> AFRL question um, about, you know, the, do, are, the, are the digital apps that are available today, can, if there is a standard data standards that you, you're thinking about that need to be in place, or it, are they able to manage that? You know, and to maybe to Daryl's point, you know, the classification level and things of this nature. So I guess the direct answer would be no, not yet. Um, but uh, I, I think um, I think standard. You know, spending six years at NIST, I would say that it's not about developing the standards or the standards capabilities, or the care capabilities there on the standards. It's about adoption. So we have the technology and the representations and the formats to pretty much do all the things that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but frankly, um, those data formats have not been adopted to a level um, that you can export them from the tools that we use within our value chains. So it's a, I think it's a cultural problem, and I think it's also, more importantly, an incentivization problem. What's the incentive um, for uh, PLM providers, et cetera, to adopt these standards to their full capability um, 
because essentially what it does is brings people out of their platform. Um, I, it's, I don't think it, can, it doesn't have to be that grim, right? If, if, if there's value somehow that they can reap from um, adopting the, the latest and greatest from, let's say, step AP 242 edition two, um, then, you know, then, then possibly they'll, they'll adopt it. John, Luminix Works is doing a lot of great work in the depots. Um, you know, maybe you can maybe give us some examples of um, you know, the type of work, either industrial IoT or you know, kind of XR cap technologies that are, could be utilized to uh, increase speed of repair. Or maybe I need to go to Joe. Yeah, I, sorry. <laughs> I just, I just, you know, there's, there's a lot rolling around in my head. I think um, some of the challenges that we've seen. Um, it's not a technology challenge. Um, it's in some cases not even an infrastructure challenge. Um, it's it's the onus to take that information and do something with it. Um, you know, it, 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 in a lot of cases, as, as we've run a number of IoT pilots and other activities, um, there's there's pockets of excellence all over the place, and our 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 civilian workforce and our airmen are doing awesome things. Um, but they don't know about what's going on right next to them in a lot of cases. And I think um, the key to that is going to be the, the big picture people transformation activities. Um, and there's whole repositories of, of CNC machine data that, you know, you talk to six different groups and nobody knows what's going on. And you talk to one guy and he says, oh, yeah, I got 10 terabytes of stuff that's been sitting here. I've been collecting it since we turned the machine on. Um, and, and, and how could that affect uh, machine uptime? How could it affect capital investment? How could it affect, um, you know, workload prioritization across um, different shops, different depots? Um, that gets at some of those efficiencies. And so I think, um, you know, as, as, as we move forward, um, better communication on, on the process side is going to be key to being able to take advantage of the technologies, being able to take advantage of the data that we're generating or we're going to start generating. Um, and that's when I think we're going to start to see some, some huge gains in those things like productivity, cost, things like that. And Joe, maybe just to round it out, you know, the improvements you're seeing in training, knowledge retention, things of that nature, maybe just some quick anecdotes for the work you've done, and then we'll close out the session. So it's always a risk to make it sound like you're trying to do a sales pitch, but I think the, the use of data to paint the picture to an individual and, and I'll and take, to tra take a training use case. Um, and uh, we put a focus in uh, serious games, whether that's in a kind of a legacy 2D sim kind of environment or a 3D extended reality environment. The ability to harness the, the, the data from game state data, from uh, biometrics from player performance and decision making throughout that, uh, throughout the, the game scenario. Take that data, do some performance analytics based on history to look at what the player's behaviors were in the game and provide them with a prediction of how those behaviors are gonna lead to success or failure and then use visualizations to provide feedback real time to help them uh, modify their, learn to modify their behavior so maybe they don't even make the mistake that the game is gonna predict that they're going to make. And so we've been able to uh, push some of these kinds of technologies out currently and the Air National Guard has, has deployed one of these game systems uh, to great effect. Um, very exciting for young merriman to be able to jump in and play a game. Um, th some of these folks, uh, they, they uh, out at the air defense sectors, they created this game, uh, this, this challenge that they call the top scope challenge using the game. So now it's not even like that it's a, you have to go train. It's a, hey, we're training this month. Whoever gets the high score is gonna get two days off. So you kind of, nobody had to make them go train. And for the young staff sergeants, first lieutenants, uh, they, all this data gets processed, it gets, given to them in a visualization. It feels normal, natural insight. There's this intrinsic motivation to understand it and get better and, and become motivated to do more. And it's really, again, harnessing the power of that data and the visualization and transforming uh, 
uh, where we're going to go. And it's speaking the language of these young digital natives and inspiring a new generation of, of airmen. And so it, it's exciting to see. Thanks, Joe. Well, on behalf of the FCA Dayton chapter, I thank you for participating today. Uh, hope you guys have a safe journey back home. How about a round of applause for our panel? And now I think we're on a break. I think that's what I'm supposed to tell you. So, thank you. <laughs>